Hello and welcome to Startup Street. I'm Arundhati Ramlin and with me as always is Shruti Mishra. These are the top headlines from the startup world. Venture debt financing firm Stride Ventures announces the final close of its second Indian fund to raise $200 million. Exceeding its target corpus, the second fund will ramp up deployment in late-stage venture capital-backed startups in consumer, financial technology, agriculture technology, B2B commerce and other sectors. E-commerce solution provider Grass, also known as Growth as a Service, raises $40 million in the first close of its Series A round led by Galaxy, Performa, Integra Partners, Huge Ventures and AJ Capital. A part of the fresh capital has been deployed to acquire 100% of D2C and data specialist Shoptimize and Southeast Asia's marketplace specialist Sell in All. Yes Bank has invested an undisclosed amount in Venture Catalyst Group Fund. The bank has also invested in its associated firms Beams Fintech Fund and Nine Unicorns. With this investment, Yes Bank aims to bolster its investment in digital finance and help tech companies ideate and experiment with various use cases such as agriculture, healthcare, commerce and education. The Central Consumer Protection Authority has imposed a penalty of 1 lakh rupees on Flipkart for allowing the sale of substandard domestic pressure cookers on its platform. CCPA Chief Commissioner Nidhi Khare told PTI that Flipkart has also been directed to notify consumers of all 598 pressure cookers sold on its platform, recall the pressure cookers and reimburse money to the consumers. Tencent suffers its first ever quarterly sales fall. As for Reuters, the company's revenue declined 3% to 134 billion yuan for the three months ended June 30th from 138 billion yuan a year earlier. Net profit attributable to equity holders stumbled 56% to 18.6 billion yuan. Meta to disable new political, electoral and social issue ads a week before voting begins for the US midterm elections in November. Ads that have previously run before the restriction period will be allowed to run during the time. The company said it is also investing in proactive threat detection. Well, those are the headlines we are following up for you today evening. On what's brewing today, new e-commerce solution provider Grass has raised over $40 million in the first close of its Series A funding round to launch a category-defining technology solution, Growth as a Service. The round was led by Galaxy Performa, Integra Partners, Huge Ventures and AJ Capital. Angel investors from across Southeast Asia and India also participated. Now, part of the fundraise has been used by Grass to acquire 100% of D2C and data specialist Shoptimize and Southeast Asia Asia's marketplace specialist, Selenol. To talk about the road ahead, joining me now is the co-founder and CEO of Grass, Prem Bhatia. Prem, welcome to Startup Street. Now, Grass's first fundraise will be used to launch the growth as a service solution across Southeast Asia and India. I believe it is an AI and predictive analytics engine. If you could tell me, how will it turbocharge e-commerce growth for brands? Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, lovely to be here. Um, I think that, you know, it's a... Uh, if you compare where we were 12 months ago, it's a fairly despondent time. Uh, growths are plateauing in e-commerce, shops are opening up again, VC funding is down. Uh, it's a perfect time to sort of launch a, a growth engine, which is just based on predictive AI and analytics. Um, and um, I think that, you know, the people selling online are grappling with margin. Uh, pressure and margin pressure could be from inventory, advertising, warehousing costs, last mile delivery costs, revenue shares, um, and so yeah, it's a it's a great time to 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 launch grass okay. and growth as a service. All right. Uh, now, you know, Prem, like I mentioned, part of the fundraise has been used by Grass to acquire D2C and data specialist company Shoptimize and Southeast Asia's marketplace specialist Sell in All. Now, the acquisition of Shoptimize also marks your India for a year, you know, based in Singapore. Talk to me about your India plans. Yeah, so here's the thing, right? I mean, <laughs> I don't know how many people realize, but uh, there's a there's a sort of a war which is about to begin uh, and it starts in Mumbai and it ends in in Manila. Okay. Um, you've got uh, the U.S. is a it, it, it's done now. It's an Amazon, Shopify play. Hmm. China is a predominantly Alibaba, We WeChat. Yes. Uh, this is where the action is going to happen over the next five years. Uh, you have everyone from Amazon to Reliance to Nike to Walmart, Flipkart to Shopee to Lazada, Alibaba. Facebook, Google, TikTok. This 
is the geography where the battle is being played. Okay. And and the reason for India Fast was simple, right? I mean, you know, India is a eight hundred billion dollar retail market. It's less than eighty billion uh, in terms of e-commerce sales. Um, that's like less than ten percent. You mm. look at China. China is like a 50-50 between overall retail and e-commerce. So, you know, we're very bullish about India and, okay. and growth. Prem, you know, in both the acquisitions that you've made, the founders have joined the board of trust and will continue to be a part of the combined entity. What is the impact you're hoping to generate with these acquisitions? Also, if you could take me through your current business growth numbers, I understand you've launched only in April this year, but what are the kind of numbers you're seeing? Yeah, so I think we internally at the board level, we would look to do a billion dollars in, in GMV. Okay. Uh, AI powered GMV, uh, not order management GMV. Um, so I think that's really where, you know, the focus is. I think that, uh, you know, it's a little different because you see Southeast Asia is a very marketplace heavy play um, with the likes of Shopee and Lazada and Tokopedia dominating. Uh, India is is less so more it, and uh, there's more D2C and data and analytics. Hmm. Uh, but look, the similarity is is uh, is fairly evident. You speak to any venture capitalist in India today, and you say, out of the million dollars you give a portfolio company, where does half go? And they'll all say the same thing: it's going into advertising. Okay. Right. All right. Uh, so, so what numbers? You can't give me a sense of the kind of numbers you're seeing currently. Um, well, so uh, it's difficult to determine. I mean, look, okay. India is at about $80 billion. Southeast Asia is at about $120 billion. Mm. That's $200 billion between the seven countries okay. that comprise India and Southeast Asia. Okay, Prem, any more acquisitions in the pipeline? Is inorganic growth the way forward for you in these markets? Uh, <laughs> I mean, look, the capital raise, uh, we're halfway through it. Hmm. Uh, it does allow for strategic acquisitions, and and okay. you'll be you'll you guys will be the first to know. Okay, all right. Frame, you know, Grass uses predictive artificial intelligence to equip brands with automated e-commerce recommendations that impact their bottom line, driving profitable growth. If you could give us a use case of how you're doing this, and also what is the kind of exponential increase in profitability you provide to your clients, if you could give us a percentage. Okay, so just. Let's just keep it simple, hmm. right? Let's say that you are an a entrepreneur, salesperson, living in wherever, right? Uh, you plug in, and then we tell you that your 100 ml face cream is selling faster than your 200 ml face cream. Hmm. We'll tell you that today it's selling faster on Nika than it is on Flipkart, that Karnataka is doing better than Maharashtra. We'll tell you that the Facebook costs today uh, a slightly more in Karnataka. We'll tell you that the last mile costs, however, are, are, are more expensive. We'll tell you that if you combine your 100 ml uh, face cream with uh, okay. a, you know, a 200 hmm. ml hand cream, you're going to exponentially increase sales. That is only possible with a you know a thoroughbred predictive AI engine, and and that's what we do. And and we're seeing the results. We're seeing customers who have plugged in and 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 they have run out of inventory because they've sold that quickly. Okay, okay. Uh, you know, one final question for you, Prem. You know, what is your revenue model? How do you make money? And are there any revenue targets that you've set for yourself? Um, yeah, I think I think it's safe to say that we're looking. We want to be a, a centaur, a uh, hundred million ARR, ARR company in thirty six months. Hmm. Um, and as far as the revenue model is concerned, it's really simple. It's we, we take a percentage of, of GMV or, or total sale. Okay. All right. All right, Prem. Uh, we're completely run out of time. And many thanks for joining us on Startup Street. And we wish you the very best with all your growth plans. No, no. Pleasure to be here. Big fan. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Prem. And, and from one fundraise to another, Bangalore-based Exponent Energy has come up with a way to deliver 15-minute rapid charging for electric vehicles. The company has just raised $13 million in a Series A round, which was led by Lightspeed. 
All existing institutional investors, Yonest VC, 314 Capital and Advantage VC also participated. The startup will utilize the funds to scale up its network. And joining us now to discuss this technology, how this technology works and its future targets is Arun Vinayak, the co-founder and CEO of Exponent Energy. Uh, Arun, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Now, like I said, you've come up with a way to deliver 15-minute rapid charging for electric vehicles. Can you take us through how this works and take us through the tech that allows you to achieve this feat? Thank you, Arun. It's wonderful to be here. It's a pleasure. Uh, right. So, I think today EVs already drive better. Uh, I think the questions holding back adoption are all things around energy. Where do I charge? How long will it take? Uh, will my battery last? And... Uh, we look at energy as a two-sided problem for electric vehicles. Uh, there is the battery and the charger, and the question of and, and how both of them work together, how do they transact energy uh, from the charger to the battery, right? Uh, so, and in some sense, a one-sided approach in the industry until now, uh, companies focusing only on the battery or companies focusing only on the charger has led to a broken bridge of energy between the chargers and the batteries. That's what we build, that's what we simplify. Uh, we build uh, our own proprietary batteries uh, called the E-Pack and our own chargers called the E-Pump. Uh, put together, they deliver 15-minute charging. Uh, and we also provide a 3,000-cycle warranty, even if you rapid charge the battery uh, every single cycle. All right. And like you said, you've raised about $13 million. So where will this money go? What's the fund allocation plan here? Well, well uh, our first focus is to uh, scale up the network. We've already built the tech that uh, makes charging seamless. Uh, the next step is obviously ensure the seamless access to the charging station and to the network. Um, and put, to put this in context, there are only around 400 to 450 petrol stations in a city like Bangalore. Uh, uh, right. Right? Uh, I mean, across the last 100 years, all the petrol companies, I'm, and I'm talking petrol, diesel, CNG, gas, put together, there are only 450 stations. So we're right. going to take that head on. We're going to have 100 uh, e-pump stations in every city we enter in, starting with Namba Bangalore. And uh, of course, on the other side, we will be using the funds to streamline our production for the battery packs. Uh, we already have a first vehicle partnerships, uh, and uh, we're going to be using the funds to also onboard a lot more exponent-enabled vehicles onto the network. Right. So you're you're planning to like scale up uh, the technology and make it easily accessible. So, like you said, you're essentially going to use the funds to scale your e-pump network to 100 locations per city. So how soon will we see this happen? You said you're going to start in Nama Bengaluru. So how many cities are you looking at currently? Is it just Bangalore? Are you looking at other cities as well? Well, we've already got the first 30 locations signed up in Bangalore, and we're going to hit 100 in this financial year in okay. Bangalore itself. Okay. Uh, we believe in a lot in testing, and that's important in the EV space. Uh, so we're going to be focusing on Bangalore till uh, in this financial year. And once we stabilize, prove out the tech uh, at scale, uh, we're then going to look at other cities, and Delhi is definitely the next stop. It's the largest uh, market when it comes to electric vehicles today. Absolutely. So 100 by the end of this uh, financial year in Bangalore and then Delhi next. So take us through your business model then. You're currently targeting OEMs, but you're also eyeing the CV space. So what's happening there? Well, we partner with OEMs. Like I said, energy okay. is a two-sided problem. Mm -hmm. We can't just set up a charging station and, uh, and hope we run a profitable station. It just doesn't work. Right. right. So we sort of have to partner with OEMs to have our batteries integrated into the vehicles. That's one side. But really, our customer is someone who's buying the vehicle and running it on a daily basis. Today, we raise a sharp focus on uh, the commercial vehicle space. These are guys who are running large stakes, last mile deliveries. Uh, clearly, they want to go electric. The big problem today is how do I run operations with a three to four hour charge time? Right? That's yeah. what we simplify. We un unlock the segment to run as many shifts as the diesel vehicle, while, of course, having all the advantage of electric, higher torque, um, lower vibrations, um, and, um, and obviously cheaper operations. And, uh, that's the segment we're focusing on. So uh, today, our business model, we are an energy company. What do you pay for diesel today? You will pay for batteries and charging in the future. And we monetize both. All right. And what's your current network like? What's the traction that you've seen for your batteries? And how quickly do you expect this to grow? Uh, honestly, uh, I don't think there's a demand is a problem in the EV space today. Okay. Uh, right? Uh, especially when you're able to disrupt the whole space overnight. Right? Uh, we, we are now providing a proposition that's as good as diesel, um, and it's cheaper than diesel uh, when it comes to operations, uh, and it's got greater performance than diesel when it comes to whole things around top. So, so uh, we believe when something like this happens, uh, markets shift overnight, right? So we, uh, and, and if you look at the last three months, uh, the three-wheeler space has already reached the tipping point. Fifty percent of the three-wheelers sold in India are now uh, electric, right? right? Um, and uh, and 
and this is despite all the challenges around energy right and now if you can simplify it i think sky's the limit uh, we are focusing on a 2000 vehicle pilot uh, in bangalore to start with along with 100 uh, e pump uh, locations so that's something that we're going to be focusing on in this financial year and then like i said we'll pick up delhi at a time uh, like the demand is really not the issue we are we're focusing on testing and executing Right. So, uh, so demand not a problem there. So uh, testing and execution right now. But let's look at the numbers then. What are your revenues currently like? What's the target uh, you've set for yourself going forward? Right. Uh, well, we're now a pre-revenue company. So, uh, like I said, we're in the early uh, testing phases with our customers. Okay. We're now transitioning to to sales starting October, uh, which is when we we monetize both the battery and the charging. uh put together the commercial vehicle space is a 150 billion dollar market when it comes to just energy and i'm not talking the vehicle sold just talking the energy market right and uh, and uh, even if you win uh, 30% of that uh, which is last mile i, I think that that that's going to be a focus uh, over the next 4 to 5 years uh, over the next uh, over the next 36 months uh, we do see ourselves expanding uh, to the top uh, 10 cities in uh, in india All right, so pre-revenue right now, but you're going to start monetizing in October, and you recently partnered with Alter Green for your battery pack. So take us through that partnership, and are you looking at more such partnerships? Are you already in talks with anybody? Well, yes, uh, Alter Green, I think, was one of the best, uh, got one of the best products in the three-wheeler space right. uh, in India. They've been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, they also recently raised a forty million round, uh, so they are expanding, um, and we decided to get together and uh, make their really good vehicle even better. uh with with um with now the fastest charging electric three wheeler in the world right and uh, uh we we now focusing on a partnership with Alter Green in Bangalore that's we're going to be doing the 2000 vehicles with them right uh of course we will work with other OEMs as well uh and we will talk about that soon uh and uh, just when the vehicles ready <laughs> right we don't know in this drink phase right so the focus right now is with your partnership with Alter Green all right Arun thank you so much for joining us on the show and we wish you all the best going forward thank you so much it's a pleasure to be here thanks On that note it is time for us to head into a short break but coming up next we discuss the key findings of Chirati Ventures report that expects the fintech sector in India to grow tenfold by 2030 what are the other tailwinds for this sector we find out after the short break stay tuned Welcome back here still with us on Startup Street India is the largest fintech ecosystem and is home to 21 fintech unicorns. The sector is now projected to grow tenfold to have 1 trillion dollars in assets under management and 200 billion dollars in revenue by 2030 according to a report by Shurate Ventures in collaboration with EY. The digital lending market with 515 billion dollars book size by 2030 will shape much of this growth the report showed. To shed light on some of the key findings of the report, I am now joined by TC Manakshi Sundaram, co-founder and vice chairperson of Sharate Ventures. Welcome to the show, Sundaram. Now, the report showed that India's fintech assets is likely to grow to one trillion dollars by 2030. Can you tell us which segments in the fintech space will be driving this growth? Could you break down the numbers for us? Yeah, I think um, the digital lending, which will be over five hundred billion out of the one trillion dollar AUM, this will be driven by consumer lending as well as SME lending, which are uh, into segments which are currently not serviced efficiently by the existing banking and non-banking um, finance companies. Um, the next largest space will be the um, belt management um, then neo banking and insurance now you've mentioned in your report that a digital lending clogged more than 9 billion dollars in investments over the last 5 years and is expected to reach a 515 billion dollars book size by 2030 the report has also said that neo banking is expected to hit a 215 billion dollars mark however rbi guidelines around digital lending and offerings like neo banking is another set of challenge how will these regulations impact the fintech ecosystem and where do you see the scope of improvement yeah see look uh, one should recognize the fact that you no know, regulation is helpful for orderly growth of the industry um in fact while in the short term regulations may look like they are going to um be um a little tighter in terms of letting unbridled growth 
we do believe that that will lead to a lot more uh, secure way in which industry will grow. And this will lead to a lot of partnerships between, let us say, traditional uh, lenders um, who have the advantage of source of capital at a very low level. Um, but that is not being delivered to the um, you know borrowers at an efficient way. So in short, the regulations are likely to have positive impacts on the fintech startups. Now, the report has also mentioned that buy now, pay later has become mainstream and is emerging strongly in B2C and B2B payment spaces. Can you elaborate uh, on this a little bit and uh, take us through some of the key trends you see emerging in the fintech sector this year? Yeah, you see, uh, financial services is a very important backbone of any economy. So if India has to grow from 3 trillion to 5 trillion to 10 trillion, and then 25 years from now, when it, and it's under the year to 40 trillion, then financial services has to play a very important role. Um, that will be discharged much more efficiently um, by fintechs um, during the cor course of this journey. Um, while actually sourcing of capital in terms of deposit side will continue to be uh, more by banks and some of the large NBFCs, which are regulated entities, but delivery of credit uh, will be substantially driven by fintechs who can do better underwriting, who look at data substantially to be able to create new underwriting models. Um, so this is where we see a disruption coming in. And this is where we see the future growth coming in, future capital going in uh, into fintechs. Okay. Now, uh, the report has also mentioned that innovative solutions are being deployed to serve three, tier three plus markets. Uh, can you elaborate on the Bharat market opportunity for the fintech startups? Yeah. In fact, see, pre-pandemic, India was largely a tier one, tier two focused digital market. Um, but pandemic actually um, opened up um, digital adoption by tier 3, tier 4 markets as well. And we do see uh, today across the board, whether it is uh, farmers who are using it, people from tier 3, tier 4 markets using it for commerce or for uh, initially content and then later using it for uh, transactions uh, is going up significantly. So tier 3, tier 4 is where actually most of the financial services have not yet penetrated sufficiently. Uh, and this is not only just geographical market, these are also virtual markets, right? In every city, you will find tier three, tier four consumer base as well. So we do see that actually FinTech will be able to bring them into the you know uh, financial fold, financial inclusion will take place, whether it is in the form of um, you know may, uh, lending to people who have so far not been lent to, and bringing them into the financial fold. Payments has actually made a lot of SMEs who have been out of the, you know, any formalized system. All right, Sundaram, one, one final question before I let you go. Uh, due to emerging technology, we're also witnessing FinTech intersections in agriculture, retail, health, as well as prop tech space. What does this mean for the ecosystem? We do see FinTech becoming more and more horizontal, where in every intersection of new business, let's say, for example, uh, a B2B market marketplace, right, for uh, a solution. Or let's say in the case of uh, consumer side, BNPL, which has come in. Uh, in agri-tech agri side, people who are transacting are able to bring in lending alongside, right? So these are the ways we see actually FinTech intersecting with various different um, vertical markets um, and helping them in terms of better adoption and faster growth. All right, Sundaram, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure interacting with you. Thank you, Aishwarya. And with that, it's a wrap on this edition of Startup Street. More news and update coming up on the other side.